days are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being bestowed. These are days of great trial, of famine in the darkness and soul.
glory returning anew. And these are the days of your servant, Joel. Restoration is coming in you. And these are the days of our pouring. The anointing is falling like rain. The Spirit is moving in blessing and power. The church is revived once again. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun.
presence of God. Hallelujah. We have in the service today um, Elaine. <laughs> and uh, when I saw her, um, I was amazed actually because we've been praying for Elaine for quite some months, as you know. Um, for those that know her and her friends that come to camp every year, and she wrote the legacy book. Um, the Hollybush family camp and we prayed for her some months ago when really she needed a miracle cancer, a complete miracle you had about, I don't know, it was touch and go for three days wasn't it then we were kind of waiting for news and um, I suppose we never gave up hope we never stopped praying and so when she walked in today, and walked in, <laughs> I thought, you know, definitely a walking miracle. And she's still believing for a miracle. I said, well, you are already a miracle. You know, when you get a death, when somebody says, well, you know, you haven't got many days, you might not live any more than three days after this operation. Yet she walked in today. Come on. Yes. And how Come wonderful. On. Yes. And this is her book, if anyone wants one. And uh, you will live to see another camp, Elaine. You will. And, um, yeah, you can work on the poems and everything. But I did hear this song this morning being um, sung by somebody, The Goodness of God. And, um, no, it's not that one. The Goodness of God. Um, and... I just thought, yes, you know, God is so good. I would just, how great is our God? Yeah. How great is our God? And when we get that concept, when we know, when we just say, how great you are, Jesus. Yes. How great you are. Elaine, you will, you will write more. There'll be another book out shortly, I'm sure, with all what you've been going through. And it's so many to, lovely to see other faces, um, like Etta and Jim and people like that. So, goodness, God, yeah, goodness of God, please, before we have a minute's silence. So we're just going to sing. I love you, Lord, for your mercy ever fails me all my days. I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of
that have gone on before we remember we remember for all those that are left here below we remember we remember we thank thee O Lord we thank thee O Lord for those that have laid down their lives for this country We are thankful, we are grateful that we are freedom, we have freedom today because of it. Amen. And all my life I have been grateful all my life I've been so good to
I'm standing in faith and I've started it that I'm going to live and not die and I'm going to see the goodness of God, God in the land of the living so I've already started it but I just wanted to say thank you and you don't know how much it means when you've got a family like this yeah. that are behind you, that are praying for you so with all my heart I just say thank you yeah. wow <laughs> what a testimony what a testimony she also lost a mum and she lost a husband last year. And this, that's why we need Jesus. Yeah. We need Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, because he lives, I can face
Father, we just thank you for these offerings, Lord. We thank you because each and every person has given what they can. And we thank you for that. Bless these gifts and bless those people, Lord, that have given. And for those that can't, bless them too. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Come on. Come on, Lash. Jesus, yes. Jesus, yes. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Can I sing in that hymn? No. Unless you want to. Come with the Spirit. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Father, Jesus. Praise God. Can't hear it, can't you? But there's a there's a sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees. Hallelujah. We all need to be expectant. Not in some ways, but it's just a joy as these dear ones, there's two, I was going to say young men, well they are younger than me, sat on the front row here, brought by our friends. First, first time they've been here, and uh, I hope they like singing. Do you like singing, fellas? Yeah, are you all right? <laughs> Is it going straight in or through? Yes. And so, it's so good to see new faces. Living faces. Hallelujah. Because our greatest program here is just to lift up the name of Jesus. Because he is our altogether everything. And as we possibly, you possibly saw quite a bit more than me on the television of these last hours, as it were. But friends, those people, thousands of them, died because they had their life taken from them. Yes. They offered to go and they went. Some lots didn't return. And so, linking back into the church today, I would just like us to sing a hymn for us today, whether you're a Christian yet or not. But God's plan is for us, those of us who call the name of Christian, we have taken up the name of Jesus by invitation by the Lord Jesus Christ inviting us to follow him. So I'd just like us to sing that hymn, please, if you will now, that I said we're going to sing, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And this is for those of us who know the Lord already. Ye soldiers of the cross, we're not at the end of this road until we get to heaven. We've linked on to the cross of Jesus Christ. We've linked on to the man that got killed upon that cross. 
crucified. And so, can we just sing that hymn now? Stand up, stand up for Jesus. <laughs> Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. He soldiers of Probably you don't know, but I served in two regiments. The first one I served in was the South Lancashire Regiment. And Harold Wilson and Dennis Healy pulled the plug on that regiment in 1967. And I went into another regiment, the King's Regiment. Now the King's Regiment, I was a Kingsman. The King's Regiment, the, the regimental motto was Ick D, I serve. I'm still in the King's Regiment with a different Colonel-in-Chief, Jesus. And the motto is still, Ick Dean, High Serve. How about you? The Lord is marching out of splendor In your awesome majesty he rides Oh, 
Central Guy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I've had lots of prayer today, so I'm hoping that on this day, which is a privilege, which has been B day, that um, we will um, all be spoken to by the Lord. I just want to lighten things up. Um, <laughs> Welcome, Adam. <laughs> I'd just like to lighten things up a minute. Could we have this photo up, Anne? So, when I first saw this, it made me laugh. And if we had this banner outside Olibush, we would like to think it would say something like a um, bit of food, bit of fellowship, a uh, bit of work, but mostly Jesus. And if you had a personal van banner on your vehicle or outside your residence, what would it say? Would it say, would it say a little bit of work, a little bit of tennis, a little bit of golf, and a bit of food, and mostly Jesus? I know at times, if there was one outside my house, it would potentially sometimes say, um, a lot of work, a bit of fellowship, a bit of food, and mostly selfish. And I think we can all be in that place at times. And often because of the world that we're living in today, because we're so caught up with everything. We're caught up in our careers or whatever we're doing. We're caught up in whatever we, the bureaucracy we have today. We're tied up. We don't seem to have time to help one another. People are crying out for help. The, just these last two weeks, I had so many people asking me for help and I'm tied up with all my own stuff. And it's the world we're living in today. And I don't want to be bringing such an harsh word to you today. We've had some hard words recently. But there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We had that word last week. And often when we're trying to press in in our own strength to become better and better Christians... Better ambassadors for the Lord. And we fail so many times, I do. Recently, I've found myself slipping into starting to do things which are hurdles that I thought I'd got over 10 years ago. But sometimes we feel like we're taking two steps forward and one step back. At times, two steps forward and two steps back. But only through God, only through Him, can we be strong enough to persevere and let everything go and give it over to the Lord. That song um, we've been singing recently, Joanna did a great job of it a few weeks ago, This Is My Desire. And part of the words, every, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. But so often we try to press in and we're failing. And we get annoyed with ourselves, don't we? But I've heard some old-time preachers listening to them just recently and saying that when we're failing, all we do is press, press, press and keep pressing in and pressing in, fully focused on Jesus, pressing in relentlessly, pressing into him and all that other stuff will fall off you. Like we've just heard that song, turn your eyes up on Jesus and everything in this world starts to become faint. When we try in our own strength, sometimes we fail, sometimes we're okay. Often better when we wake up in the morning and spend time with Jesus. My mum used to say when I was younger, be careful spending too much time with them, you'll end up being like them. So let's, spend, let's spend time with Jesus and hopefully we'll become like him. Some people, and some in this house, have the strength and the courage and the conviction to let go of everything. 
and follow the Lord. And the disciples did just that. Can we take that down now, please? The disciples did just that. And when Elijah walked over to Elisha and threw his mantle over him, Elisha turned around and followed him straight away. No question. And I would imagine he would have been humbled to some degree, the fact that he'd been chosen. Now, Elijah could have chosen anyone. He could have gone to the school of prophets. He could have gone anywhere to the temple. He could have gone anywhere to choose somebody to follow him. But he chose Elisha. Elisha, as we know, he was plowing the field. He was on the 12th oxen. That would have been the one with the responsibility, as we learn from Scripture, that he would have been on the end plow. But he was in there with his sleeves rolled up, working hard along with the servants. And it would have been his father's place. He was working for his father. He had an inheritance in the worldly. But he had a position. He was hard-working, committed. And obviously, he served. And you know, I've said this a few times just recently. God is not looking for superstars. He's looking. He's looking for servants. I've come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Hallelujah. He said, can I just say goodbye to my family first? Which is not a lot to ask, is it really? Now what he had was, obviously those people around him, he had, he had security. It was his father's place. He had all, I would imagine he would have been friends with those servants. He had his family around him. And he left it all. Just like that. And then the next 50 years of his life would have been put into ministry. And he just asked, can I have a little bit of time with my family first? As we know, he had a bit of a barbie, didn't he? A bit of a beast. To sacrifice one of the oxen so he could say goodbye to them all. Elijah said yes to this, of course, because he knew his heart. And then, I suppose, in layman's terms, he would become the apprentice for Elijah. And toward the end of him being with Elijah, before Elijah was taken away, he was tested. In my opinion, he was tested three times. I need to have a drink of water. Give me a smile, Jean, please. <laughs> <laughs> he was tested three times, as we know. Because Elijah said to Elisha on the way down from Gilgal to Bethel, he said, stay here, the Lord has sent me down to Bethel. And Eli Elisha's reply was, as long as my Lord lives and as long as you live, I will not leave you. Again, he said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me down to Jericho. And again, he said, as long as my Lord lives and as long as you live, I will not leave you. And again, he said, the Lord has sent me down to the Jordan. Stay here. And he said, as long as my Lord lives, as long as you live, I will not leave you. By which time, at this time, he knew that Elijah was going to be taken away from him. As he tells us in scripture where the people had addressed him and said, do you know your master's going to be taken away? He said, yes, I do. I'm not speaking too fast for you, am I? Can everyone hear me? If you can't hear me, put your hand up. All right. so, <laughs> so when he got to the Jordan, Elijah struck the Jordan, as we know, with his mantle. The waters parted, they walked over on dry ground. 
And Elijah said to him, he said, what, what can I give you before I'm taken up? What would you like? He said, a nice, shiny, charcoal grey Aston Martin. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. He said, I want a double portion of the spirit which is lying upon you. A double portion of that spirit he asked for. He didn't ask for gold, so he didn't ask. He asked for a double portion. And he said, if you see me taken up and you live, it will be given. And as we know, he was taken up from the chariot. From what we can see in Scripture, there was only him and Enoch that were taken up alive. Not mentioning Jesus, by the way. So, after he'd been taken, obviously he would have been hurt, broken-hearted, upset, walked back over to the Jordan, struck it, because he'd picked the mantle up, struck the Jordan, the waters parted, he walked over on dry ground, and the 50 men looked at him and said, look, the spirit of Elijah is resting upon Elisha. And when he got toward them, they addressed him as sir. And they insisted on looking for Elijah. But Elisha said no, because he knew where he'd gone. And they said, we like it here, but the water is unclean. That was his first miracle. After, after parting the water on his way back over, he cleansed the water for them. And it's clean to this day, from what we're told. But what I want to concentrate on today is chapter 5. In 2 Kings, chapter 5. And I've got three lovely, amazing volunteers to read this scripture out for me. Because if I read it out, some of you might drop to sleep. And someone said, they'll start throwing eggs at me. Is that right over at the back? Yeah. So could I have my first volunteer up here, please? <laughs> to break things up a little bit. So the reading is from 2 Kings, chapter 5, and it's the whole of the chapter, so three of us are going to read this. Now Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given him victory in Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor but a leper. And the Assyrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would heal him of this leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you will heal him of his leprosy. And it happened, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me, to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was, when Elisha the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, 
Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and your flesh shall be clean. Technology. <laughs> Here we are. Read it, read it from the bottom, Brian. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him, and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him, to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, May the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Rimen to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimen. When I bow down in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. Amen. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. 
And when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. And when he came to the citadel, he took, he took from their hand and stored them away in the house. And then he let the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money, to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep, oxen, and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, as, what is snow, as white as snow. <clears throat> there we go. That was the King, sorry, the New King James Version there. Thank you for the readers. Now we'll take a look at the NIV, we'll run back through it, but I will take you back through this step by step. So as we know, these countries were at war. Israel was at war with the sur surrounding countries at that time. They are still now today, aren't they? If we read the news. And... There was a band of rebels that went out into Israel and they stole the young girl. So she was serving Naaman's wife and she said to Naaman's wife, if only my master would go and see the prophet in Israel, he would heal him. First of all, I was astounded with this, actually, because the fact that she'd actually said that to him is a miracle anyway. But he, he went to see the king, and the king said, right, I'll write a letter for you and send you to see the king of Israel. He sent him down there with 10 shekels of, sorry, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. When he got there, as we know, the letter read, I have sent my servant Naaman for you to heal him of leprosy. Now, if we received that today, some of us would think that that was a bit of a, a practical joke, wouldn't we? But he was distraught, upset, thinking, are they trying to cause war again? What's going on? And he was... Frozen with fear, I would imagine, in the natural. And we've all been there. And when we read through those scriptures, we look and we think, well, how could he have been frozen with fear when he'd seen Elisha, who was living just up the road, do amazing miracles in the past? And if we remember, Elisha was there when they were stuck. Because the king of Israel had got together with the king of Edom and the king of Judah to overcome the king of Moab, the Moabites. And on their journey, they'd run out of resources. They were, they were lost in the hills, 
had run out of water, and they went to see Elisha. And Elisha filled the valleys with streams of water, and they were restoring their animals and regrouped themselves. And then the Moabites came down, and as the Moabites came over the valley, they saw all these streams of water, but the sun was reflecting upon them, and they thought they'd been fighting one another. And these were streams of blood, so they rushed straight down there. And as we know, they overcame them. So, uh, so the king of Israel had seen this, he'd witnessed this in the past. And he would have heard about all the other miracles which Elisha had been performing. They didn't have TV in those days. Some of you could here could probably remember not having TV. But they had Bush Telegraph, didn't they? And he would have heard about this. But in spite of that, knowing that Elisha was up the road, he still was frozen with fear. And how many times do we get confronted with overwhelming circumstances and we're frozen with fear, knowing that God has done so much for us time and time and time again in the past? But Elisha, this is my Yorkshire version, by the way, said to him, Stop stressing out, send him up here and I'll sort it out. So, you have a little drink. It's good that I've got all your attention anyway, at least I know you're listening. All them serious faces. So, when he went to see Elisha, we read that Elisha didn't even come to greet him. He sent one of his messengers, to tell him to go and dip himself in the Jordan seven times. And at this, we know that Naaman was outraged. And I believe that at that time, Elisha had given him some of his own medicine because Elisha, we know that Elisha wasn't a man of arrogance. He was a man of humility. He served the Lord and he was a man of humility. We know that. And I believe he gave this Naaman a taste of his own medicine there. But how did re Naaman react to it? Because people of arrogance, and people are arrogant towards them. Look how he acted like a, a little boy and rushed off, outraged, and stormed off. And it was his servants that said to him, if he'd have asked you to do something heroic, you would have done it. These would have been men, or women, men, I would imagine, who would have been humbled by their circumstances, who would know what humility is, would have been used to being told what to do. And they urged him to go down and dip himself in the Jordan seven times. And isn't it ironic that we see that, not just in the world, but sometimes in in church, churches around the land, where people in certain positions, the people serving them are far more mature spiritually. And had you not listened to them, you'd have not got healed. But at least we know that he was approachable. And he went dipped himself in the Jordan seven times and came back to see Elisha. Offered him, tried to pay him off, I suppose, with these ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten sets of clothing. He, he would have given him everything he had. I believe that he would have given him his position, actually, to be healed. But Elisha wasn't interested in taking anything from him. He wasn't interested in the gold or the silver or anything. He said, I don't want any of it. But here, look what happened next. Naaman said, Now I know 
that there is no God except the God in Israel. There is no other God. And he asked for forgiveness for worshipping false gods. And he asked for as much soil as he could, as two mules could carry so he could take that back because he said he would do no more burnt offerings. And he asked Elisha to forgive him because he knew he would be compromised having to walk into the, the temple of Rimen when they were doing the sacrifices that he would have to be with his master. And we have people here today who are compromised not fully doing what the Lord would want us to do because we're full of fear or circumstances would hold us back from doing just that. What was Elisha doing here? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was living out scripture. He'd just done a conversion. A modern day evangelist would have been well chuffed with that, wouldn't he? Right? He'd just converted him. He was blessing his enemy. He was forgiving. Because let's face it, in the natural, they could have said, no, let's take this guy out because of the audacity of him coming over into their land after what they've been doing. They could have taken him out in the natural. But no. He healed him. He blessed him. He didn't want anything from it. He was building bridges. He knew that his resources were in his relationships. If he'd have wanted gold and silver, or all those kind of trappings, he would have asked for that. When Elijah said, what can I give you before I'm taken up? Blessed be the peacemaker. He was making peace at this time. And the lives that would have been so saved, can you imagine how many lives would have been saved here? Because would Naaman not have thought twice the next time they went to cause war? Would he have not thought twice? Wait a minute. These are the people who healed me of leprosy, who didn't want to take anything from me for it. Because it is quite difficult to persecute people who are being nice to you. This man of God, this prophet, was living out scripture. And we know that of all people, Elisha, Elisha would know that his resources were in his relationships. Let me take you back to chapter, the beginning of chapter 4, the, the lady with the, hot, with the oil. When she said, uh, went to Elisha begging him, saying, I've lost my husband, I've got two children to feed, we've got nothing, I've got no, how, how can I carry on? And he said to her, what do you have of any value? She said, I've just got a bit, a bit of oil. And he said, go out and see all your, your neighbours. Would have been a family of friends. Go and see them all. And ask them if they've got any jars. Now a jar, container or whatever it would be in those days, wouldn't have been a throwaway item. And she was blessed according to her blessing. Because we know that when she was pouring the oil and they run out of jars, the oil stopped. This man, more than anybody, knew that his resources were in his relationships. And Gehazi had run after Naaman in spite of spending all that time with Elisha. He'd run after Naaman. Lied to him, by the way, and said, my master has said that there are two young men come down from the school of prophets from the hills in Ephraim. Could you give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing? As we know, Naaman said, I'll give him two, two talents of silver and two sets of clothing. And when he got back and stood in front of his master, Elisha said, where have you been? He said, I've been nowhere. Where have you been? He said, I've been nowhere. He said, do you think my spirit was not with you when that man stepped down from his chariot. 
When we're failing, God sees. We serve a, we serve a powerful God of truth, but a God of mercy and a God of love. And some people, when they're reading that scripture, they're thinking, why? Why so harsh when there are other people who've been, who we see in scripture who've been let off with so much? But we know that Ananias, when they were deceitful, lying and greedy, they paid the price for it. And when Elisha said that leprosy will cling to you and your descendants for the rest of your life, it didn't mean that he sent him to hell, though, did it? It doesn't say that. But I would imagine he'd have been so upset because it's kind of destroyed what Elisha was trying to do here. But how many times do we fail in our lives? Because we can be so critical of all those circumstances. We can be critical of Gehazi when he ran after Naaman. We can be critical of the king of Israel when he was dumbfounded, struck with fear. We can be critical of all these other soldiers that were killing for nothing. Brian, could you come up and play some uh, music for us? We know that we're living under grace, but every one of us could do better, me included. We serve a good God. And that place where they were in war at that time and all the blood being shed that's still happening today as we read the news how many times have they tried to overthrow Israel but it's still standing they are God's chosen people and we're God's chosen people. And I would like us to pray for one another today. I would ask for some people to come to the front to pray. And if you feel like you don't want to come to the front for prayer today, I'd like you to, as we finish off in worship, I would like you to lay hands on the people at the side of you or around you and start praying for one another. Because we all, every one of us, fail in our own strength and it's only for God. God's looking for servants, not superstars. We're called to serve and witness for him. And though it might seem like a big stretch for us, to live out scripture the same way as this man of God Elisha was doing at that time he was forgiving he was blessing his enemies he was a peacemaker and he let go of everything to follow the Lord and I'm not saying that every one of you are called to do that but we all have a heart to do that that song this is my desire to one of you Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Every breath that I take, every moment that I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I ask that you rekindle every one of us, Lord. That our inspiration is awakened, Lord, in every one of us, where we start to slip into apathy for various reasons in our lives, where we've had unanswered prayer, become despondent, things are not working out for us. I love you all, all of you. A great bunch of people here. 
And we are called to love one another. We're called to love the Lord and love one another. So I just ask, Lord, that you would raise us up, Lord. We are remnant now in this country. Raise all of us up, Lord, that we'd be great ambassadors for you. And that we'd start to live lives worth all these soldiers in the past worth dying for. Live lives worth you dying for, gracious God. And as we fail in our own strength, just ask that the Lord will intervene, supernaturally intervene, and take us all to that different place.